to study His precious Word. I come in a while ago and I was packing two Bibles. And I had a little interview with the lady back here. And, and I told her if I preached out of both of them, I'd have a pretty good text. <laughs> but this is a Greek lexicon. So uh, just something I want to read out of this tonight. It's a, it's a, it's the word-for-word -word interpretation from original Greek into English. And it's been a lot of help to me along the line. And I just wanted to read something out of it because now we're studying in this book of Hebrews and we're just now coming to the real deep Amen. meanings. And I told Brother Neville a few minutes ago, we're getting into the part where the people scratch their heads and I don't believe that. <laughs> That's the type we get into. That's where we like it. Some minister said to me, he said, well, I guess there'd be a lot of head scratching. I said, that's what we want to do. Amen. See, the Bible only can have one meaning. It can't have two meanings. And if one part of the Bible says one thing and another part of the Bible says something else, then something's wrong. Amen. Amen. It's got to say the thing all the way through. But remember, in studying the Bible, it's hid from the eyes of the wise and prudent and revealed to babes because it is of a spiritual book. And it's not a Western book, it's an Eastern book. And there's only one thing can interpret it, and that's the Holy Spirit. And I know that each one of us wants to say that the Holy Spirit's telling us what we believe in. Well, now, if every scripture lines up exactly the same, then that is the Holy Spirit. Amen. If it doesn't line up and got a gap here and a gap over here, then there's something wrong Amen. with our belief. And oh, it's a marvelous book. Now, I want you to do this while we're studying. Now, we got to leave early in the morning for Wyoming, the Lord willing. Pray for us. And this next week, Brother Grim Snelling here. He's present. I heard him just a few minutes ago making his announcement. And this church is in full cooperation with his revival. And we're praying to God to give him an exceeding, abundant, great revival. Brother Graham held a revival for Brother up here at Charleston, Brother Junior Cash. And there was right on 100 converts, I believe, 84 converts. So to that we give God praise. And we trust that it'll have 584 up here at this place here. Brother Graham met me today and he said, Now, Brother Bill, I'm sure that you understand that I'm not here to start up another work in opposition to the tabernacle because I'm part of the tabernacle. He's just sure to, he feels upon his heart that he wants to hold a revival and the Lord leading him to do it. And, and he invites the converts and has a church to pour them right down here as a church home if you get, in, get converted. And it's our duty as Christians to back him up with everything we can. And the Lord bless Brother Grimm. And you're everyone accordingly invited to Brother Grimm's meeting up here with full permission from this church with a full cooperation to help him in any way we can for the lost souls and for the kingdom of God. Lord bless you, Brother Grimm. Give you a great meeting. You don't know when he's going to close. He's just starting. And so... Brother Grimm's had, like myself, many ups and downs. That's the way life runs. It makes you appreciate the ups after you went through the downs. <laughs> if a man makes a drop and lays there, he's a coward. I got confidence that a man will rise and try again. That's right. I'm sure you can interpret what I mean. Now, don't forget it this coming week. Now, in this book of the Hebrews... We won't take the background tonight. Now, next Sunday, the Lord willing, Brother Neville will announce, Brother Cox here, some of them will let him know, if we get any time for next Sunday's meeting, he'll announce it on the radio. Amen. And we're, y'all listen to his radio now, and, and, and invite all your neighbors to listen. I really get joy out of listening to their preaching and singing, the Neville Quartet. I don't say that because he's sitting here. If I said that didn't mean it in my heart, I'd be a hypocrite. Right. I'd have to repent. But I mean it. 
And I'd rather give him a little rosebud now than a whole reef after he's gone. Amen. One time I was walking out the door there and there's a lady come by and she said, Brother Bram, oh, how I enjoyed that message. I said, thank you. Made me feel good. Somebody else come out and said, Brother Bram, I enjoyed that message. I said, thank you. There's a little preacher there from up here in the north part of the country, the state. He said, bless God, I don't want people to brag on me like that. I said, I do. And I said, there's just one difference between me and you. I'm honest about it. <laughs> That's right. We all like to hear nice words said about us. And I, I think it's nice to say nice words about it. And if you want somebody to say nice words about you, say some nice words about somebody else. That's the way it is. Then you'll always say the nicest things you can about everybody. And that makes the wheel roll better. Amen. Now, in this uh, next Sunday, the Lord willing, to my opinion, we got just getting deeper and deeper into these great mysteries of God. We're going into Melchizedek, who he was, where he come from, where he went, what happened to him. And all about Melchizedek. And now, last Wednesday night, Brother Neville hit on the finishing chapter of the supreme deity and the priesthood of our Lord Jesus, which starts out in the beginning. God in sundry times and diverse manners spake to the fathers by the prophets in this last day has spoken to us through his son, Christ Jesus. Then he goes on and begins to tell and pattern who he was. Brings him on down to the fifth chapter. At the end of the fifth chapter, then beginning at the sixth chapter, we got this in our lesson this morning. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. How many enjoy the message on perfection? Amen. Let us go on to perfection. That was our message this morning in the sixth chapter of the Hebrews. Now we're just getting into the place to where we begin to get the, the real part. All we can all agree upon these things, upon the deity of Christ and him being the son of God and how he was with God and God was with him and he was in God, God in him and so forth. We all agree upon that. But now from here on, I don't know how we're going to agree. So whatever it is, Every few nights, we're going to give you a chance to write me a little note and tell me what you think about it. Then I'll have to answer questions. And if I can't get them, I'll say, Brother Neville, what do you think about that? <laughs> I'll say, there he is. Let him answer it. That's when I read the Greek. And that's when he's going to read the lexicon. the Greek. <laughs> I think it's time for me to also. But now, if we will get down and be real sincere. Amen. And really come for one purpose. That's to learn. I want to learn too. And the Bible is written, said and it is the scriptures are of no private interpretation. That means the scripture must interpret scripture. The, each scripture must interpret the other. All the way through the Bible to make it one great thing because God can't change because he's the unchangeable God. Now, leaving... Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. I like Paul saying those things. Paul never was a person that liked to stay too long in one place. He liked to move on deeper. One time in the scripture, he said, uh, forgetting those things which are in the past, I press towards the mark of the high calling. See, he keeps pressing on. Here he said, now forgetting the principles of the doctrine of Christ, who he was, what he was, let's go on to perfection. Now we first, we want to find out, could we be perfect? And we found out in the scriptures this morning, Matthew 5, 28, that Jesus said that we had to be just as perfect as God was or we wouldn't go in. Then we found out there was everyone born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. And there was not one sound thing about us. So how can we ever be perfected? Now here's what we find out then. Over reading big scripture with scripture. That Jesus by one sacrifice perfected forever Amen. his church. He, we are then per perfect through Christ. 
And we are free from judgment through Christ. Amen. We shall never die through Christ. We have lost death and found life through Christ. Not through any church. Not through any denomination. Not through any fantastic. Not through speaking with tongues. Not through shouting. Not through shaking. Not through dancing in the Spirit. But by grace. Amen. God calls who He will. And it's all by election we find out. We find out that it's not him that wants to be saved. Not him that willeth or him that runneth. It's God that showeth mercy. And no man can come to Jesus except God draws him first. So what you got to do with it anyhow? You haven't got nothing to do with it. You're out of the picture altogether. We found out that man never seeks after God. It's God seeking after man. Amen. And we found out then... That God is the only resource of eternal life. We found out that everything that is eternal has no beginning or no end. Therefore, we find out that hell had a beginning and it has an end. And there's only, no one can ever say that hell is forever. Uh, uh, forever, yes, forever, but not eternal. Forever is a space of time. The Bible says forever and forever. And you look it up and find out if forever doesn't mean a space of time. Jonah said he was in the belly of the whale forever. And many other scriptures, forever only means a space of time. But eternal, that's forever. That's forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. It's the eternal. And we find out that Hell isn't eternal, but it's forever. And the reason you have to watch those words now. If you don't, you get mixed up. Now remember, just those things which had no beginning has no end. Therefore, Jesus said, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has life forever. Does that sound right? No, has eternal life. And the word eternal is God. The word, here it is right here in the Greek lexicon. Zoe, God's life in you. And you're just as eternal as God is eternal. Because you've got God in you. Amen. Your old nature died. The nature of the world. And you become a new creation. And your desires. That old life that had a beginning. When God breathed the breath into your nostrils when you were born. That life of carnal nature died. Amen. And it had a beginning and it had an end. And it died. And was done away with forever. The old nature. And God came in with the new nature. Then love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, peace, patience, meekness, and kindness. That entered and taken the place of malice and temper and hatred and, and immolation, strife, and all those things. It took its place when you pass from death unto life. You get it real close now? Amen. So listen, there is only one form of eternal life. Find it. That is God alone has eternal life. The Bible said so. God alone has eternal life. And if a man's going to suffer in hell forever, he's got to have God eternal. But I say that there, I remember, I'm not saying there's not a burning hell. There is a burning hell, fire and brimstone, where the, uh, the worm is, the fire isn't quenched and the worm never dies. A fire and brimstone, a punishment, it may last for a hundred billion years, but it has to have an end. For hell was created for the devil and his angels. 
and everything that the very God Himself, which was in the beginning, everything come off of God. When the very Spirit, let's take the Spirit of love, that was the great fountain of God, pure, unadulterated. From that come in a perverted love. Then it come into human love. Then it come into sexual love. Then it come into other love. Loves and loves. And this keeps perverting down to it becomes to just filth. But all those things had a beginning. And someday it will wind right straight back to the original. It's eternal. Where lust, human love, passionate love, all those loves will have to cease. All these make-beliefs of faith will have to cease. There's one true faith. All others will have to cease. They were perverts off of this real fountain. So therefore, hell, suffering, suffering is not eternal. Suffering was brought about because of sin. And sin introduced suffering. And when sin is finished, suffering will have to finish too. And there will be a time where sinners that's never accepted Christ after they have been punished maybe for a hundred billion years. I don't know. Maybe for ten hundred million million years. I couldn't say. But it will have to come to an end sometime. Because it's not eternal. Now, we're going to press on now towards the perfection. Now listen as we get into the message. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and from faith towards God of the doctrine of baptisms laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now listen. We got two, we got a picture here now. Now right here's where we're going to get some great disagreements. Now you've got to see where the picture is. Paul is trying here to separate law from grace. We've got two pictures. One the carnal, one the spiritual. And Paul's trying to, to deviate between the two to show the Jews. This letter is to the Hebrews. And all the Hebrews is trying to show the pattern of the Old Testament type in the New. So you've got two pictures here under consideration. Now listen close as we read. Now I said, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Now we got that this morning, how that we are perfected. Perfected. Absolutely spotless and blameless. Not one sin on us. Amen. Are you above temptation? Never. Do you sin every day? Yes, sir. But yet we are perfected because we are in Him. And God could no more judge us than nothing. He couldn't be righteous. He's already judged us in Him. When He judged Christ, He judged me. He judged you. And He can't judge me again because He took my judgment. If I've been redeemed and i got a ticket to show that I've redeemed my wash in the pawn shop, let somebody try to take it back to the pawn shop once. When I've got a ticket... I have redeemed it. And if the devil would try to put punishment on me, I've got a ticket that shows I've been redeemed. Yes, sir. No more judgment. He that heareth my words, believeth on him, and sent me, has eternal life, and shall never come to the judgment, but has passed from death unto life. That's my ticket. He gave the promise. Now, now the picture here, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, the doctrine of baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. Now remember, do you notice that word used again? We used it this morning, eternal judgment. When God once speaks, 
It's eternal. It cannot be changed a bit. So the judgment is eternal. It's always the judgment. And no matter what generation we're living in, one generation will live in, one law will live in, it's forever, for whatever time, and this and that. But the judgment of God is still eternal. He has to because He spoke the Word. When God speaks the Word, it has to be eternal. Amen. That's right. Now, let me read that out of the Greek for you. Listen how it reads. Therefore, leaving, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, the atoned one, we should push towards the... Now, I can't read it. It's blurred out. And not laying again the form... Here we are. Not laying again the form... Of reformation from the works causing death. Now, this lexicon is absolutely not any interpretation at all. It's just the Greek word for what the English says. And it said, Now, we don't want, listen here, see, not laying uh, down foundations. Of reformation from works causing death. Now, if you get that in your mind, that he's speaking here, that forms of reformation causes death. Paul said, leaving the principles, go to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. And a faith towards God, doctrines of baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Reformation, forms, causing death was the right words. That's actually what Paul wrote. See what he's trying to do? Now all these things like baptisms. One's baptized backward, one forward, one in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, one in Jesus' name, one this way and that way. And all these different little things of baptisms and of laying on the hands. Bless God, I got the gift of laying on the hands. Hallelujah. You, you can do it this way. Hallelujah. Laying all of that aside because that's dead works. These reformations. Reforming. See, he's speaking of another class. I said, let's get away from that and go on to perfection. You get it? And the church is still lingering back in those things. That's what they were trying to do. The early Hebrew church was trying to say, Well, I was baptized by immersing and, and I was uh, got this and this and all these things. He said, Now lay all of that aside. Leaving it behind. But now did he say we shouldn't do it? Now listen to what he said about that. And this will we do God permit. And the original said the same thing. This we shall do if God will permit us. See? This we shall do if God permit us. Baptisms, laying on of hands and things. But that isn't perfect. That's only the carnal reform. And that's where the churches leave off at today is on the carnal reform. One of them said, oh, well... The water, the word baptism means this and it means that. And they set up organizations and one sprinkles the other and pours the other. Baptizes face forward, the other and backward and all those things. Some of them laying on their hands for the sick and some making apostles and some making prophets and so forth. But laying on their hands and preaching the resurrection from the dead, and which is all right. And the supreme deity of Christ, that's all right. But he said, all these are formal Reformations. We've just been reforming. Now let us go on to perfection. You get the picture? Now watch. Here's where the deep part comes down. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift 
and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted of the good word of God, the power of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now, I know what you legalists has got in your mind right now. But you're wrong. <laughs> All right. I stand on this and the Bible confirms it. That if God ever saved the man, he saved for time and eternity. You can't make it say anything else. Some fundamentalists come to me not long ago and said, I got you on one, preacher Branham. I got you on. You said if a man was saved, he could never be lost. I said, that's what God said. He said, I want to ask you something. Saul was a prophet. And he prophesied. And you know he was God's anointed. The Bible said he was. And he committed suicide. And he was lost. I said, he was. I said, the Bible declares he was saved. After he become an enemy to God, he was still saved. The Bible said he was. And after all, he did not commit suicide. A Philistine killed him, and David killed a Philistine for killing him. Amen. He did fall on his sword, his spear, sword, but he did, it didn't kill him. And a Philistine killed him. And then when Saul went down to the witch, and she called the spirit of Samuel, because he hadn't entered glory, he was in paradise, under the shed blood of bulls and goats, which couldn't take away sin, but he had to have a waiting place, which is called paradise, until he entered in. That's where you Catholic people got mixed up. See? Now, there is no more paradise now. We go straight into the presence of God. And when the witch of Ender called up the spirit of Samuel, there he stood and she fell on her face. And she said, why did you deceive me? And not only was Saul standing there, I mean Samuel... In his prophet robes, he was still a prophet. He said, why did you call me out of arrest? Said, seeing that you become an enemy to God. He said, well, the Urim won't speak to me anymore. The prophet can't prophesy to me no more. Neither can I have a dream. Well, Samuel said, you become an enemy to God. But tomorrow, the battle goes the other way. And you'll die tomorrow, and by this time tomorrow night, you'll be with me. If Saul was lost, so was Samuel. <laughs> There's both together. Certainly the Bible said so. Now, you can be all worked up in emotion by speaking in tongues, shouting, jerking, shaking, running up and down the aisle. Nothing against that. But you can make yourself believe that you're saved when you're not You're not saved. Your life will prove what you are. Jesus said it would. By their fruits you shall know them. Your life will prove whether you're saved or not if you never open your mouth. It'll prove what you are. But all this work up and emotion and joining church and I've been baptized in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I know I got it. That doesn't mean nothing. I've been baptized in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost face forward three times. I got it. That means nothing. Paul said, let's go on to perfection now. We're talking about perfected. And if we'll run this down, you'll find out the perfected is the elected. I'll prove it to you in a few minutes. Amen. By the Bible. Amen. It's the elected who God before the foundation of the world seen every one of them. And he sent Jesus to redeem that people, not the whole world. He wanted to, but he had to make a way for those. And the only way he could do was to send Christ. That he might come the propitiation of our sins. That those who have been elected, he could bring to him in glory. Could you imagine God running his office so loosely as to say, Well, maybe somebody will think real sad about me. Maybe they'll come and get saved. God don't have to beg you to do nothing. Then he's begging you need to do the begging. Not God. And then Christ died to save those who God by foreknowledge elected 
to meet him yonder without spot or wrinkle before the foundation of the world. He's seen you in glory. That's what the Bible says. Ephesians, the first chapter. Fifth chapter, the first verse. God predestinated by foreknowledge. Now, if God did that, predestinated us before the foundation of the world and knew every one of us by name before the foundation of the world and elected us to eternal life and sent Jesus Christ to redeem us that 6,000 years ago He saw us that we might appear to His praises and glory. How can you ever be lost? Now, if you're saved, you're saved. If God saves you tonight knowing He's going to lose you 10 years from the day, He's defeating His own purpose. The infant, almighty, eternal, everlasting wisdom God doesn't know enough then to know that whether you will hold out or whether you won't. Then when He saves you and say, well, I'll give Him a trial and see what He do, then He does not know the end from the beginning. Amen. God knows what He's doing. Don't you never worry about that. Amen. It's you and I stumbling along. Amen. God knows what He's doing. And He knew we, whether we'd hold out or what we would do. Now the Bible said that Esau and Jacob, before either child was born, God said, I love one and hate the other one. Before they even breathed their first breath, that is... Election might stand true. Who was Abraham? We'll get to him in a few minutes down here. Who was he that God should call? Save him without anything. God makes a covenant. Man, man breaks his covenant. But God made this covenant with himself and swore to it to himself. Man has nothing to do with it. God's own foreknowledge. He done it anyhow. Now you say, well, Brother Branham, then if I become a Christian, I can just do anything I want to. Absolutely. If you're a Christian, do anything you want to. And I'll guarantee you won't have any desire to do wrong. Amen. <laughs> you do anything. I've always did just what I wanted to. And if I serve the Lord because I'm afraid I'm going to hell, I'm not serving Him right. If I live true to my wife because I'm afraid she'll divorce me, I'm not a very good husband. But I wouldn't hurt her for nothing. For I love her. That's how it is with Christ. When a man is born to the Spirit of God, not because he shouted, spoke in tongues or some emotion, but in his heart, love come in and taking the place of the world. I tell you, he loves Amen. him. He walks by him every day. Amen. You don't have to tell him it's wrong to do this or that or the other. He knows it's wrong. Amen. And he Amen. walks. He's an ordained product of God's sovereign grace. Amen. Exactly. For it is impossible... For those which were once enlightened made partakers of the heavenly calling. Now we sometimes believe that that was a man who once was enlightened and fell away again. But the Bible doesn't read it that way. It's absolutely impossible for a man, he says here, that has received the Holy Spirit to ever fall away. I'll read it and find out that isn't right. Watch here. Take the text, the whole text and the contents, context rather. Now he's beginning to talk about what is it? Let's go on to perfection. Now I said not carnal laying the foundation here of doctrines and baptism and reformations and so forth. Let's not do that. Let's go on to perfection. The subject is perfection. And perfection comes by Christ. And how do we get in Christ? By joining the church? By one spirit. We're all baptized into one body. Not by one tongue talked in, one hand shook in, one water baptized in, but by one spirit Amen. we are baptized into one body. You get it? Amen. That's the perfection. And when you come into that, you are in Christ. And the world is dead to you. And you walk with the Lamb each day. And your steps are ordained of God. What to do? All the trials and testings that we go through. You say, do you have testings? Yes, sir. What is grace is what God did for me. 
Works is what I do for God. Now they make a doctrine out of it. They think it works is what wins your merits. If it is, it isn't a free gift. Grace is what God did for you by grace you're saved. And works is what you do in appreciation of the grace that He showed to you. And if you love Him, you like to do the works of the Lord. Certainly. Because then you you love Him. Accepting me Broy as my wife was what love done for her. What she does in appreciation, she's a nice woman, stays home, takes care of the children and lives a good true life. That's not because we're not married. We are married. But she does that in appreciations. If she run downtown every day and tuck in every 10 cent store and up and down the streets and never wash the dishes or anything else, we are still married. Absolutely. When I tuck my bow, that settles it. She's my wife. As long as there's life in us, she's my wife. That's her vow. Wow. But what appreciation she does for that. She stays home and takes care of the children and tries to be a real wife. Amen. I could run out and be gone all the time and scatting about over the country. And let her half starve or anything. Let the children go without something to eat. We're still married. If she even divorces me, I'm still married. As long as there's life in my body, I took that bow until death we separate. That's right. We're still married. But yet I'll make a poor excuse of a husband. She'd make a poor excuse as a wife. So if we love one another, we stick together and pull the load together. That's the way God in His church is. When you're born in the kingdom of God, you'll have your ups and downs. True. But you're still a Christian. You're still born to the Spirit of God. God may have to take you out of the earth early. It's impossible for those which were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift to ever fall away to renew themselves again unto repentance. Now, I know where you're thinking about the church. Let me take you one that's a little stronger so the, the legalistic side can be really shut out. Let's go over to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and look at this just for a little bit. 10th chapter, 26th verse. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking of the judgment, and for indignation which shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' law, die without mercy under two or three witnesses, of how much more sore punishment those supposed, the worthy uh, trod the, who has trod underfoot the Son of God, and is counted the blood of the covenant where he is sanctified an unholy thing and done despite to the works of grace. I say, what about that, Brother Branham? How does that look? I just read and I think the Scripture doesn't say that. That's not talking about a Christian. That's talking about a man that heard the Word and turned away from it. See? For if we sin, what is sin? Unbelief. If we disbelieve willfully, after the gospel's been preached to us, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. What is sin? Unbelief. Let's read St. John in the fourth chapter. Jesus said, He that believeth not is condemned already. Sin is not smoking, drinking, committing adultery. You do that because you're an unbeliever. That's just the attributes. You do that because you're an unbeliever. Just to quit smoking, quit drinking, and so forth like that. That doesn't mean you're, you're Christian. That's just the attributes of your conversion. But you can, you can do either side and still not be. Now, notice, he that disbelieves willfully after he, not, not after he received Christ in his heart, the Bible doesn't say that, said he that... If we sin willfully, disbelieve willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth. Get it? Wasn't talking to a Christian at all. Some woman come to me not long ago and said, Brother Branham, I'm a Christian, but I blaspheme the Holy Ghost. I said, it's impossible. 
A Christian could not blaspheme the Holy Ghost. You can't do it. A Christian spirit bears record with Christ's spirit. See? And you'll call everything of God, God's. But if you're carnal minded, you'll make fun and laugh at the Holy Ghost. I don't care how much you go to church, you're still a sinner and you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. When they seen Jesus discerning the thoughts, they said he was a fortune teller. Jesus said, you, I'll forgive you for that. But when the Holy Ghost has come, you speak a word against it, it'll never be forgiven you. Because they said he has an unclean spirit. Calling the Spirit of God an unclean thing. A Christian can't do that. A Christian will always call the Spirit of God righteousness. See? A Christian cannot blaspheme the Holy Ghost. It's the outsider that blasphemed. That wasn't Christians standing there. It was religious people. It was Orthodox Jews, doctors of divinity and so forth. And they were making fun of him and his works. Calling the works of God that it was an unclean spirit doing it. And how many of you think today blasphemes the Holy Ghost that's got DDD, PhD on their name? How many great stiff Orthodox, Catholics, Protestants walk the street and make fun of the operation of the Holy Ghost? Just as polished scholars and slick as a button. Right? But they make fun of the Holy Ghost and therefore they blaspheme it. But a born again Christian cannot do that. He'll say, that's my brother. That's the spirit of the living God. Right. A Christian cannot blaspheme the Holy Ghost. It's a sinner that blasphemes the Holy Ghost. The unbeliever, the sinner, an unbeliever. There's only two things. Either you are a believer or an unbeliever. Now, notice here, to make this real wound up now, I had a vision that's always bothered me. Years ago, I used to look at that. I said, oh, if a man once received the Holy Spirit then, and then would backslide, he'd be lost forever. I couldn't get this other to make sense with that. I said, then why is it that the Bible said that he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life, eternal, and shall never come to the judgment, but has passion death into life? All the Father has given me will come to me, and none of them's lost. I'll raise them up the last days. No man can pluck him from my hand. How does that divvy up with this? I just couldn't understand it. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened. I thought there's something wrong. I just can't get it. And I went to a little Pentecostal meeting years ago. There's not a one left in the church, I guess, tonight. That remembers. Years ago, this was even just about time the tabernacle was built. Let's be Brother Graham back there. Or some of the, I don't know if you shared first or not, but so Brother Mahoney, I think, was, yeah. Just before I was married, that gift to working, I was afraid. They told me it was of the devil. I didn't know till the angel of the Lord told me. I went up to Mishawaka. And I was sat in that meeting and I never heard so much shouting and crying and praising God. I thought, brother, this is heaven. And all how they would go. Up and down they had to have it in an Arthur McCown of segregation. The colored and white were together, the PAFW and the PAFJC, that really emerged and become the United Pentecostal. But what a revival they were having. There at Brother Rouse Tabernacle at Mishawaka. And I, a little curious fella, sitting on the back seat, was watching all of this. I'd never seen these things before. There's a man sitting here. I've never told this in public before. There's a man sitting on one side and a man on the other. And one spoke in tongues, the other interpreted. And they would tell different things that was going to take place. Then this is speaking tongues and that would interpret. I thought, my, isn't that wonderful? I thought, how glorious. There must be angels come down in the form of man. Well, I only had a dollar and 75 cents to come home on. And I, I, I just could get a tank of gas. I slept in a cornfield that night. I've got part of my book, but not all of it, because I didn't want to hurt the feelings. And so that night they said all preachers come to the platform. I was on the platform as the youngest preacher there then. So the next morning they asked me to come to preach. I hid. You know, the colored man said, here he is. You remember the story of it? When he exposed me sitting there. And so 
After preaching that day, walking around, I thought if I could only get to those two men, they led the meeting. One would raise and turn white in the face. He'd speak in them, and the other would interpret it and give the words. Thus saith the Lord, there's a certain, certain person here by the name of certain, certain that should do this and certain, certain. Brother, it was the truth. And the other rise and speak in tongues, and he would interpret. I thought, oh my, isn't this wonderful? So that day, I thought, I went out and prayed, and I thought, Lord, you do that for me again. I didn't know what to call it. Visions. I went out and prayed and asked the Lord to help me. I went around the building, and I happened to run into one of them. And I, the Lord gave me a way of knowing things. I shook his hand. I said, how do you do? He said, how do you do? What's your name? And I said, Brandon. Oh, he said, you're the young fellow that preached this morning. I said, yes, sir. While I got a conversation with him, I caught his spirit. And he was a genuine Christian. Just a pure Christian, brother. I mean, he was a believer. I thought, oh, isn't this wonderful? And about an hour from then, out there near the car, which is looking on a great big car, had Jesus only, he wrote on the back of it. And standing out there stood the other man. And I went out and I said, how do you do, sir? He said, how do you do? He said, you're Brother Branham that spoke this morning. I said, yes, sir, I am. I said, say, I enjoy them great gift of God that works in you two brethren. He said, thank you, Mr. Branham. And I began to feel his spirit, a vision come. And if I ever talked to a hypocrite, there was one of them. His wife was a black-headed woman. He was living with a blonde-headed woman had two children by her. He was no more Christian and nothing in the world. Then I said, what have I got into? I thought it was an angel, so now I must be in demons. Something's happened. Here was one, a genuine Christian, and the same spirit falling on this man was falling on this man. I said, now I'm all confused. I didn't know what to do. I cried and prayed to the Lord. I didn't know what to accept. This about to get me to ask me if I'd receive the Holy Ghost. This guy didn't. I said, no, sir. Not the way you got it. Said, you ever speak with tongues? I said, no, sir. Said, then you haven't got it. So I said, oh, you're probably right, my brother. Uh, maybe I haven't. Because I don't have what you have. And after a while, I was glad I didn't. So then I watched that and I seen the way that was moving. So one day I was out here praying. Long ago. i tell you why. Who I was praying for it was Roy Davis. Now, is that your... Praying because he called me a puppet. And I was praying for God to forgive him for it. And he had a press back there, wrote a paper, and that press caught a fire and burnt down a couple nights after that while they were running it. And so I was standing back there in an old cave behind Green's Mill. And I walked out there and I was praying, been back there two days. And I laid my Bible down on an old log where I showed Brother Woods not long ago. Laid my Bible down there, set a straddle log, and the wind blowed. I thought, it been so long back in that cave, i just read a little. So I took all the Bible and began to read, and this was the chapter it was on. Well, I began to read, and I began to wonder then. See? For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, made partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted the good word of God in the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew themselves to repentance. Seeing that they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. I thought, there's that scripture, but something hung with me. Then I began to think. Here's where he talked back here in the beginning. Not laying the dead foundation of repentance at the beginning. Not laying the foundation of repentance. And here he says, new, renewing themselves back to repentance. But let's go on to perfection. Laying these things in the back. Then I started reading. Then I read the next verse. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat, for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessings from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. And when I read that, something just shook me. And I thought, Lord, that don't pertain to Roy Davis. Why would you do that? I started turning around the page and I had to go back to it again. It is impossible for those which are once enlightened. Go through it again. Then I thought, Lord, what is this? What do you mean, Lord? And I turned and went back into my cave to pray over it. 
And when I did, I saw a world turning. And it was all disked up, real nice, the whole world. And I saw a man in white going around. He had a bag in his hand. He was sowing seeds. As he went around, he went around the curvature of the earth. And as soon as he got around, here come a guy dressed in real black toes, a slick looking fella, slipping along like this looking. And he had a seed and he was throwing something behind it. As he went around the earth, watching everybody and throwing. I stood and watched the vision. After he had gone, the world turned around and there was a great big crop. And it was of wheat. And there was weeds, cuckleburrs, and things in the wheat. There come a drought. And oh, how that little wheat hung its little head over and was thirsting for water. The little cucklebur had its head hung over and it was thirsting for water. Everybody was praying for rain. And after a while, along came a big cloud and just watered the whole earth. And the little cucklebur jumped up and began to shout, Glory to God, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And the little wheat it jumped up and began to shout, Glory to God, praise the Lord. And then the scripture come to me, which is found in the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter and the 45th verse. And listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 45. And listen close now as we read. Matthew, the fifth chapter and the 45th, 46th verse. 44th to begin it. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despisefully use you and persecute you. That you may be call, you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on evil and on good. And sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. So you see... The same rain that makes the wheat grow makes the cucklebird grow. And therefore, I got the picture. There's your carnal confessor that's right in the church. But his fruits, he might shout, jump, dance, speak with tongues. But his fruits, he's a cucklebird. And there's the other one that's got the same spirit. The Holy Spirit can drop right into a bunch of people and a hypocrite can shout by the Holy Spirit. Just the same as a cucklebird can live by the rain that's sent. That's what Paul's speaking of here. But it's impossible for a cucklebird to become a wheat or wheat a cucklebird. You get it? For it is impossible for those who've been once enlightened and have partaken of the gift of the Holy Ghost and tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come to fall away to renew themselves again. Listen to what he said. For the rain comes off upon the earth to water it and to dress it here and prepare it. But which is thorns and thistles is nigh unto rejecting. Now, therefore, leaving the principalities and doctrines of Christ, let us go to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance and dead works towards God and faith and so forth and doctrines of baptisms, laying on the hands and things. See, the carnal believer back in those days, just like it is today, likes to say, well, I've gone to church. I've repented. I, I've come up, I've made a confession. I've been baptized. See, they lay to those carnal reformations. And what does it do? It produces cucklebirds. What does the perfection do? It's the wheat. The wheat is God's word. He uses it as his word. It's his seed. It brings forth. It depends on what seed sowed in your heart. If you come to church just because you're afraid of hell. If you join church because you don't want to, you don't want to go to hell. You're still a cucklebird. If you, if you join church just to be popular. You're still a cucklebird. If you've done all these formal things that's to be done and that's all you've got, you're still a cucklebird. But a real, genuine Christian presses towards perfection. Amen. Until the world is dead and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, then it's impossible for that man to ever fall. That's what the Bible says. See how that compares with the rest of Scripture? See how it lays it right in there to its place? How can it say here a man that's once saved can never be lost? And some warriors say, but if you are lost, they're blaspheming. It's impossible. 
Sure, if you're a blasphemer, you're not a Christian. No man speaketh by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse. St. John 4. Or 1 John 4. No man speaking by the Spirit of Christ calls Jesus accursed. Every Spirit of God that's in the Christian church agrees with everything God said. We read here and say, He was wounded for our transgressions with His tried through a heel. The old carnal mind say, Days of miracles is past. I'm Dr. Jones. See? There's no such a thing as divine healing. No such a thing as heartfelt religion. You're as much worked up. You're emotional. See, that's all there is to it. Another nothing to it. We are Presbyterians, we're Lutherans, or whatever it is. We know where we're standing. But what does the Spirit of God say? Jesus Christ the same. Amen, says the Spirit of God. It agrees quickly with the Word. Yes, sir. It's right there. See what I mean now? These carnal reforms works death, said Paul. But where life is come, this perfection, he that heareth my words, believeth on him and sent me, has everlasting life. And shall never come into condemnation, but pass from death unto life. I'll give him everlasting life, raise him up in the last days. All the fathers given me will come to me, and none of them's lost. Can't be. So here's what it does. What it does, people think so that makes people loose. Brother, you don't serve God under a frown of a serpent. God's not one of these guys with a black snake whip driving you around. He's a father. He's love. God is love. And the Bible said in St. John, He that loveth is of God. Amen. You love God. I wouldn't be, if I went out and, and got on a drunk tonight and never drank my life. But if I went out and got on a drunk, I wouldn't be afraid of getting a whipping. That is the reason I don't go, uh, go, don't go do it. The reason I don't do it is because I love Him. He loves me. It's not a works of law. It's not something that i got to do. It's because he's already done something for me and I love him for it. Amen. There you are. So with that spirit in there, which is promised, I give unto him everlasting life. And they shall never perish. Amen. Did he lie or did he tell the truth? He told the truth. So you see how this interprets? The impossibility is for a man to fall after he's once in grace. He can't. He can fall, sure, but not back to repentance. Back to the place of the do the old works over again. So you all trotting from revival to revival, one place and then another. Don't you see? You're not stable. You're not established. Ah, surely, you say, brother Branham, I don't know where. The, surely. God would not give me the ministry he has and let me be an error. And if it wasn't proven by the scripture, then it would be error. But here's the scripture to back it up. The church has never missed a place. People go join church, fuss, fight, stew, and uh, everything, and just live any kind of a carnal life. Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. I heard a confession today of a little lady that told me that her husband was running with a man. She's caught him place after place. And the woman says, I'm going to let you know I'm a Christian. Look over here at Jimmy Osborne. Out here preaching on Sunday morning and boogie woogie rock and roll and everything through the week. Look at Elvis Presley. A 1947 version of Judas Iscariot. George the Assemblies of God, Pentecostal, speaking in tongues for the Holy Ghost. And sent more souls to torment and all the bootleg joints has been in the last 50 years. Perverted the mind of little teenage children all over the world. Till little girls would grab off their underclothes and throw it on the platform and him an autograph. So vulgar that they won't show him in the television from his waist down the way for his body. The Holy Ghost speaking in tongues for evidence. Oh, brother, if the Holy Ghost was there, it wouldn't act like that. You no know better than that. Amen. Certainly not. God loves cleanness and purity and holy. I don't act clean and pure and holy to make myself a Christian, but Christ in me lives that in me. And I love Him. And if I do anything wrong, it condemns me. Right there, I say, God, forgive me. Every day I've got to ask forgiveness. Every day, every, and you do too. Certainly you do. 
But now, if you're, if you're carnal, you just wait on that. Say, oh, well, that's all right. I belong to church. See? And then when you blaspheme is when you don't have the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Then you make fun of that and call it an evil spirit. Say, that's a bunch of holy rollers. Then you separate yourself between grace and judgment. Then you're finished forever. Jesus said one word against it. It'll never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. And a Christian born of the Spirit can't say evil about that. Because it can't. It agrees with it. That's right. That's the reason people try to tell me that pillar of fire there that appears here with us. They try to say that was the devil. That it was just fiction. And all this. But the camera proved that it wasn't. And the works lay right exactly on the Bible. Same pillar of fire that met Paul on his road to Damascus. All these things that he done back there is doing it just exactly in the same way by the Bible. It's Christ, the Son of God. And when we're born again, we have everlasting life and cannot perish. It would be impossible for a man to fall. That's what the Bible says. Now listen. Watch what Paul says. Now read the rest of it and see if that don't sound right now. Let's go on just a minute. The eighth verse. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. That's the unbeliever. Now watch Paul. But beloved, now he's talking about them trying to get back around the law, you know, trying to do all the works of the law, yet they're just as ritual as they can be. They have baptisms and the laying on of hands and all these things. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. There you are. Listen to him now. And things that accompany salvation. Oh, through, through this we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your works and labors of love, which you have showed towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. See what he's talking about? He's not talking about Christians falling away and impossible to come back. He's talking about carnal believers who go through the form of reformation. But he said, to you who is born again, you who are Christian, beloved, we're persuaded better things of you. You don't say those things. You don't live that type of life. You're secured with Christ. What did he say right here? Now, let's go to Hebrews 10. Where was that this morning again? Now, let's turn over then again to Ephesians 4.30. And let's get this just a minute and watch what this says. To back this up to make Scripture go with Scripture. Ephesians 4. Uh, let's see. Ephesians 4 and 30. Let's read and see what it says. Listen. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. How, how we baptize into the body? One Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Whereby you are sealed until the day of your redemption. Is that right? You're sealed into the body of Christ by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, not from one revival to another, but until the day of the body redemption. That's what you are. So there's no way for you to be lost. You get scared. And that's the reason scare, a scare, fear accompanies doubt. Love accompanies faith. I love my father. I'm not afraid of him because I love him. He wouldn't hurt me. He'll do good for me. If I was scared of him, oh, I don't know whether he'll do it or not, see? But if I love him, yes, Father, I, I love you and I know you're, you're my father and you love me. And I'm not afraid to watch you keep your word. It's your promise to me. That's the way the Spirit of God does. But oh, if I did this, if I did that, see? There you come to the legal side again. Never go to the legal side. It's negative. The positive side is what you want. It's already a finished work. Christ died and the sin was killed when he died. And if God foreordains you to eternal life, all the Father has given me will come to me. There you are. Can't be lost. You're secured forever. 
For by one Spirit, we're all baptized into one body, and by one sacrifice, He's perfected forever. There you are. There's no way for us to lose. Correctly. Now, don't it make you feel good? Now, how do you know you're a Christian? Your spirit bears record with His Spirit. <laughs> when the love of God is in your heart, when you have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, patience, goodness, meekness, that's when you, the fruits of the Spirit is following your life. Now, because you can dance in the Spirit, all oh, of this modern rhythm, hoop it up on the piano. So a lot of this, you're dancing in the Spirit. And things are all right, but they took the whole thing over on that legal side. See, and therefore they left the Spirit of God in the back. That's the reason when God began to manifest Himself, they said, nonsense, we don't want to do that. They don't know God. They've never seen it. They can't understand it because there's a different life in there. He doesn't know, Cucklebur doesn't know what the wheats are doing. He's a different life. That's the way it is with a Christian. To the carnal believer, the confessor, who goes out and confesses, oh yes, I'm a Christian, a big cigar in his mouth like a dehorned Texas steer, a woman with her shorts on, said, oh yes, I'm a member of the church, sure I am. Your fruits prove that you're nothing but carnal. That's right. Certainly it is. There's only one thing to allow for that. That's either mental deficiency or a spirit of lust on you. That's right. If you want to act like the world, the Bible said if you love the world or the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. Amen. So there you are. Now you say, oh, the Bible said that I must do that. No, that's not it. Stay here until Christ has done something for you that takes that out of you. Amen. Amen. Then you're born to the Spirit of God. Not what you do, it's what He done for you. Until you get a love that you pass from death unto life. And then watch your life if it, if it dallies up. Not because you try to make your life, but because God brings you into subjection to His Spirit. Amen. It's not you leading yourself in God's way. It's God leading you in His own way. Amen. Not you doing the leading, but God doing the leading. Now watch this. Now just as we get down towards the end. The 11th verse. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of the hope unto the end, that ye may not be slowful, but followers of them that who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Now, just one more remark here. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiply, I will multiply thee. When God met Abraham. Now, Abraham received the covenant without any merits at all. The covenant was made with Abraham. It's absolutely grace altogether. Abraham was not a better man. He was not a holiness man. He was just an ordinary man. And God, by election, chose Abraham because God elected him. Amen. Not because Abraham wanted it. Because Abraham did this. Because he was a good man. Because he had any merit at all, but it was God's choice. God took Abraham. Today, as I said, I believe... We select our preachers. We go around and say, well, one of the deacons quit. Let's find the best man in the building to take his place. Well, the pastor quit. Let's find out we get the best. Sometimes that's not right. When they selected a man to take Judas's place, they got the wrong man. They got a gentleman, Matthias, a great scribe, a scholar, a diplomat. They said, he'd just take the real place. Boy, he looks like a real man. But it wasn't God's choice. And he took this man and he never done nothing for God. But God took a choice of a little old high-tempered, hook-nosed Jew to come down there with his face all over. I'll go down and I'll arrest him. God said, I see something in him. I'll use him. And God appeared before him in that big light there and he said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. Why, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Why are you persecuting me? Like that. And God took that man and made him one of the greatest men that's ever hit the face of the earth since Jesus Christ. That was God's choice. Today, we try to make a choice. 
You churches, you send this man here and that man here. It's not supposed to be done that way. God does the leading. Amen. It's God in all, through all, over all. Not what some document of some church is what God said about it. What makes the difference? Notice, God made the promise to Abraham unconditional. And now wait, Abraham did not have to do one thing. God said, I have already done it. God made a promise to Adam. He said, Adam, if you'll not touch this, you'll live forever. But the day you eat thereof, that day you die. Adam said, I just wonder what it's all about anyhow. He goes over and eats it, tampering. Every time that God make a man makes his covenant with God or God with a man, a man breaks his part. So God had to do something because he seen what man was and they were foreordained, they were elected, and God had to do something. So God came down and made his covenant with Abraham unconditionally. If it would have been unconditionally, Abraham would have been lost a long time. Look at him sitting down there, Greer, backslid. Tell him a lie. And give his wife over to another man to save his own skin. What a man. <laughs> Setting out there and backslid, God told him, said, don't you leave up here. Stay up here. The famine run him out. He wandered down to where it's easier going. You know what happens to a fellow when he takes the easy road. He wandered out down there where the grass is greener. And when he got down there, he told that king that his wife was his sister. To save his own hide. Now that was a lie. And any man would take his wife and give her over to another man to save his hide. There he was sitting out there in a little tent, backslider, telling a lie, and plumb out of his cut all together away from the promise and everything, but he was still God's prophet. And there was Amalek, he was a good holiness man. Sure, said his prayers every night. Found this grandma of a hundred years old come down there, beautiful and young again. He said, that's the girl I've waited for, so I'm just going to marry her. Abraham said, you can have her. She's my sister. She said, that's my brother. So he takes her over there and has the women to wash her all up and, and uh, put on nice clothes and fix her up like a, like a princess. And he said his prayer and stretched out the bed and turned his feet up and said, tomorrow I'll marry that beautiful Hebrew girl, that, that boy's sister out there. Oh, it'll be wonderful. Oh, Lord, you know how I love you. Yes, sir. Wonderful. And God said, you're just as good as a dead man. <coughs> Pardon me. Abra Why, Abraham was sitting over there lying, backslid. And here was this man, an honest and just and upright man. Why, well, he said, Lord, you know the integrity of my heart. Did not he tell me that was his sister? He said, I know the integrity of your heart. That's the reason I'm keeping you from sinning against me. That's right. I know the integrity of your heart. But her husband is my prophet. Hallelujah. Boy, oh, that he what is. Backslid. Telling a lie and sitting out there, but that's still my prophet. You take an offering and go to him and take his wife back or you're a dead man. I won't hear your prayers no more. Let him pray for you. Amen. Amen. There you are. That's my prophet. Now, you say, oh, I wish that had been Abraham. If we are dead in Christ, we are Abraham's seed and our heirs according to the promise. Amen. Right. That's what the Bible said. Would you like to read it? Why, the Bible said that, that the promise is not only to Abraham and his seeds. Like if Abraham had many seeds. Sure, many children. Ishmael was his child. He had seven or eight children after Sarah died. By another in Cush. But look. The seed was the promised one. Which was Isaac. And through Isaac came Christ. Through Christ came us. Amen. Amen. The promise is unconditionally. Now, what about Abraham? Why, it had been done. It had been impossible for him to ever get back again. Sure. It had been impossible for Saul to ever get back again. If that, You'd have to read the scripture that way. See? But it wasn't. God's promise endures forever. Let's read here just a minute. I want you to read it. I want you to get Galatians. 3.16 and read this and see now what the 
promise is and see if, what, if, if we are His promise or not. 316. Listen here. All right. I'm going to read the 15th verse 2. Brethren, I speak after the manner of man, though it be but a man's covenant. Yet if it is confirmed, no man this Lord uh, addeth thereunto. Now to Abraham and his seed, seed, S-W-E-D, to his seed were the promise made. To Abraham and his seed. Now watch. He saith not, and to thy seeds, plural, as of many, but as one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Then Christ was the seed of Abraham, and we be dead in Christ and baptized into his body, we are Abraham's seed and are heirs of the promise. Amen. Then how's it, how are you ever going to fall away? If God made the promise to you, how are you going to ever backslide and go away and have to go to hell for it? Now you say, well, can't we backslide? Absolutely. And when you backslide, you're going to get it. Don't you worry. Amen. Abraham got it and the rest of them got it and you'll get it. Don't you think it gives you a right to sin? It doesn't. You'll pay for everything that you do. You'll reap what you sow. You do one little sin and you'll reap a whole wash tub full right. But brother, that don't mean to say that you're lost. It's exactly right. Abraham reaped exactly what he sowed. It's right. But he was still saved. The covenant that God made with Israel, they lost their inheritance. They lost the promised land and went down into Egypt, but they hadn't lost their covenant. God said, I remember my promise to Abraham. I remember it. And I've come down to deliver my people. Go down there, Moses, and tell Pharaoh, I said, let my people go. I remember I made a promise to Abraham and to his seed. That's the same thing it is with us. So if you are dead and your life is hid in God through Christ, there's not nothing in the world can touch you. Now, you might go and do wrong. But if you're really, truly a child of God and you see you made a mistake, you'll rise and try again. Right. And you'll not lay there. But if you're cowardly, if you're a cuckabur, if there's no get up to you, you say, oh, well, there wasn't nothing to it anyhow. The kingdom of God is like unto a man took a net and went to the sea, cast it in. When he come, he had turtles, frogs, snakes, lizards, spiders, and fish. That's the gospel when he's preached. Like the Lord will tell a minister, like Brother Graham going up here, go on this corner and fish a little while, Brother Graham. Or he takes his net and goes up there and starts singing. Where are you going, Brother Bill? I'm going out somewhere else and cast on this corner. I'm pulling. There they are, Lord. You know what they are. I'll throw the net again. All right. Here they are, Lord. Now, the turtle was a turtle to begin with. You just got caught in the net. That's right. And that's why people get caught up in emotion. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. They just got caught in the net. That's all. If that old turtle spirit's in them, it ain't going to be long to say, well, I tell you, here he goes creeping back. An old lady crawfish will say, but I just can't understand that. <laughs> Miss Spider will sit there a little while, she'll go plop, 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 right back where it wasn't nothing in anyhow. Miss Serpent will say, oh, they're a bunch of holy rollers. That's just all there is to it. I'll go down where they got better sense than that. Why well, you snake to begin with? The gospel net just caught you, that's all. But the fish is tucked to the master's table. He was a fish to begin with. The seed of him was a fish. He began a fish. And God knowed his fish from the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. And remember, they're all breathing the same muddy waters out there. They're all breathing out of the same creek. That's right. We all made drink of the same spiritual rock. All that eat men in the wilderness, Caleb and Joshua eat the same manna that, that the rest of them eat. And they all fell in the wilderness. But there was two elected to go over, and they went over. And that's right. Amen. We all been made to drink of the same fountain, but not all the drink is saved. 
We all made to shout together. We're all made to rejoice together. But the elected is saved. Did you notice it said the two spirits in the last days would be so close to it would deceive the very elected if possible. Amen. If possible. Amen. See? Amen. That's the real spirit of God. Elected to eternal life. Now we're closing. Then Brother Neville will pick up where I'll leave off here. All right. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 400 year, 430 years after, cannot this law that it should make the promise of non-effect. That's the promise God gave Abraham before the law ever come into existence. For if the for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of the promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Not by nothing you do. Not by any laws. Any laws of your church. By joining church or any other law. It's absolutely a grace act of God to you. There you are. Watch. Wherefore then? Serveth the law? It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Isn't that just as plain as the nose on my face? It was added to serve until the seed came, which was Christ, to who the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels and in the hands of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one but God is one. Now I'll leave from right here, beginning for right there for Brother Neville for this coming Wednesday. Now, do you understand what we have said? That it is absolutely impossible for a born again Christian that I don't mean uh, he calls himself born again. I mean a real born again Christian that ever fall from grace. He cannot do it. He can fall. That's right. But he cannot never get out of that grace. Abraham fell from grace. Sure he did. God told him to stay there. He went out of it. But he never lost his covenant. He was still God's chosen. He was a prophet sitting there. He will always was. He will always be God's. Now, notice the Bible said that all of Israel will be saved. How many knows that? The Bible said all Israels will be saved. Now, Israel is not Israel which is of the flesh, but Israel of the Spirit. For gifts and callings are without repentance. Is that what the Bible said? The very next verse, Galatians. All right. All of Israel will be saved. Every one of them is saved. How we become Israel? Being dead in Christ, take on Abraham's seed, and we're heirs according to the promise. Paul said, that which is outward is not a Jew, but that which is inwardly is a Jew. The promised one. And we are Abraham's seed by the promise through Christ, accepting him as our personal Savior. Oh, I hope you see it. I hope you get it. If you can stay with it a little while. Now, over in here, we finish this up. Then we start on Melchizedek, which brings right back in this again. We start running right over to, oh, it's just a whole thing is wonderful. But we just keep getting into those cream things. Now, I see, if you tuck this year, it looked like, if you didn't read it just from observation, like a real strict Trinitarian who believes there's three gods, told me one time that Matthew 3 absolutely declared that there was three, three individual persons in the Godhead. I said, I got to see it. He said, watch, standing right from this pulpit. He said, looky here, Matthew 3 said, when Jesus went straightway out of our law, the heavens opened on him, he saw the Spirit of God like a dove, and the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. There was three, the Son on the bank, the Holy Ghost in between, and the Father up above. I said, brother, the Scripture doesn't read that. Oh, yes, it does. I said, now read it again. Find out if it does. Now, here's his picture. Here's God the Son. There's God the Father. Here's God the Holy Ghost like a dove. Now watch. The Bible said, when Jesus was baptized, the sun went straightway out of water. Lo, the heavens above him was open. And a voice saying, of Esau, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, like a dove. Not another person up there, but this Spirit of God was the dove which was above him. 
And a voice coming saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am pleased to dwell in. Now read Matthew 3 and see if he doesn't say that. See? Not three people. Not at all. That's why this doesn't say that it's impossible for a man to ever get back. That when he backslides, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It says it's impossible for a man to ever come back to renew himself after he's once been there. He cannot do it. The Bible said he that's born of God does not commit sin, for he cannot sin. For the seed of God remains in him and he cannot sin. How can I be called a sinner when there's a sacrifice laying there to take my place? How can I die when death has been paid for me? How can I die when I got eternal life? How can I do it? You can't do it. How can I have a written permit from the mayor of this city to run 60 miles an hour through this city and any officer arresting me for running 60 miles an hour? How can you do it? I've got a permit from the mayor that says I can do it. He can't rest me. He's is, is to blow the whistles and everything else and I can just ignore it. Don't mean a thing. I've got a permit. And how can I then, as after Christ has died for me and I become His righteousness, because of His grace and love to me, how can I sin when there's something laying between me and God? A sacrifice. I can't sin. Can't do it. God never sees me. He sees Christ. He stands in my place. And when I do anything wrong, Christ takes my place. I made my confession. I'm wrong. He's right. Lord, you know my heart. You know whether I mean it or not. And I'm wrong. Forgive me. God never sees it. The blood of Jesus got me covered all the time. Then how can God ever see me? How can sin be, uh, be counted to me? When he can't do it. Just as soon as I do it, it's forgiven. That's right. Just like taking a, a little dropper like this, a little eyedropper, and take it full of black ink and hold it up over a tub of bleach and just drop it in there and then try to find it again. It just turns to the bleach. The ink becomes bleach. And that's what your confessed sins, if you're in Christ, between you and God is a whole tub of bleach. <laughs> and your sin becomes righteous because a righteous sacrifice is waiting there for you. When I come to the river at the ending of days and the last winds of sorrow have blown, there is one thought that cheers me and makes my heart glad. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. That's one good thing. That's one good thing. I won't have to cross it. One of these days we're coming down to the end of the road. The sun will refuse to shine. Then God will call. Adam will reach over and shake Eve and say, Honey, here it is. <laughs> it's time to wake up. Eve will reach over and get a hold of Abel and say, Come forth, darling. It's time to wake up. Abel will get a hold of Seth and Seth will get a hold of Noah. Noah will get a hold of... <laughs> oh, on down. On down to Abraham and down as it come. There will be a great shaking and awakening when the Son of God comes. We'll stand in His likeness of that day. Now, if you commit sin here, you're going to pay for it. I just keep coming in my mind. I've just got to tell it. I've tried to quench it all four or five times. I have to say it. How many remember this brother pastor? You were at the Church of God, brother. Um, Dur uh, right up here. What was his name? Worked for Bar Gang down there. Oh, you all. The first Church of God, right here on the corner. I used to sell Raleigh's in time of the of the depression. A real godly, saintly man. Brother Smith took his place up there. I'll call his name in a few minutes. He was a God-saved man. Remember, if you don't walk up to the correction and you do something wrong as a Christian, God will warn you. And then if you don't take the warning, He'll just take you right off the earth. That's what he done. You remember in the Bible? Look at that Corinthian church. He told them what they was positionally in Christ, but he warned them of what was going to happen. And they corrected themselves and got straightened out with God. And this little brother, he was a wonderful little brother, I believe a God-saved man. And he got in a job down here at the at Bar Games. 
If some of his people sit here, I hope you don't think it. I, I don't know you if you're sitting here. But Ramsey, Brother Ramsey. How many remembers Brother Ramsey up here at the Church of God? Sure you do. Wonderful little man. And he used to come to my house. We'd talk together and we'd sit there and weep and hold one another's hands. A real Christian. One day I went into down there. I'd just come from overseas in a meeting. had my car checked up. Brother Ramsey said, what can I do for you, Billy? I said, check her up, Brother Ramsey. Change your oil. Okay, he said, fine, Danny. He said, you have a nice meeting? I said, oh, Brother Ramsey, it was wonderful. I said, I wish you could go with me sometime. Why don't you go with me? He said, I don't serve the Lord no more, Billy. I looked around and I said, what would you say? He just kind of said, I don't serve him no more. Walked away and I thought, oh, he's just going on. I went on, went somewhere, come back, got my car. I come up home and I begin to think about that. I don't serve the Lord no more. The Lord put on my heart to go back and ask him again. So I said, meet him just hold a fort. And I got in and got my car and went back down and stopped again. Went into bargains. I said, Brother Ramsey, I want to ask you a question. He said, all right, Billy, what is it? I said, you said a while ago you don't serve the Lord no more. You just teased me, wasn't you? He said, no. I said, Brother Ramsey, you, you don't mean that. He said, yes. I said, don't you love him? He said, if I loved him, I'd serve him, wouldn't I, Billy? Walked away on the road. Say, Brother Ramsey, said, I won't talk no more about it. I went home, went in the room, shut the door. Oh, you know how you feel real heavy, like you'd taken the cookies away from a baby or something, you know. I, I thought, well, what? It can't be. Surely something's happened to Brother Ramsey. And there's a little colored boy named Jimmy. He comes here to church, got one leg, you know, he limps kind of. I forget his name. Works out there at Bar Gangs, runs a record. He met me and he said, you know, Reverend Branham, he said, I don't know about this yet, Dr. Ramsey around here. He said, I told him the other day, he said, we all were scared to even open our mouth around here. He said, you was a godly man. But said, he took his preacher's license and went over to the basket and tore them apart and threw them in the basket. He said, I don't want nothing to do with it no more. He said, hey, mister, said, you oughtn't to do that. He said, oh, Jim, I'm through serving the Lord. So he went on and said, you, you don't mean that. And said, then he told me, said he's coming down to grind his vows on a labor day, I believe it was. And he said, now, I want you to come help me, Jim. He said, I'll help you after I come from church. But first, I was going to church. Said he went back down and Mr. Ramsey's grinding the vows on his car. He said, Jimmy, slip over the river. The saloon's is closed here. Slip over the river and get me a case of beer. He said, Mr. Ramsey. I've been guilty of many things, but never will I be guilty of getting a servant of the Lord a case of beer. <laughs> he said, no, sir. I'll never do that. And he said, well, go on and get it, Jim. He said, Mr. Ramsey, I'll grind your vows, but if you get any beer, you go get it yourself. So I ain't going to never get a servant of the Lord or anything like that. So Ramsey jumped in Jimmy's car, took over the river, come back half teed up with a case of beer drinking he started going down. He got sick. See? God couldn't speak to him. I warned him. I've done everything I could. Brother Smith went to him and warned him. Everybody tried to do everything they could for him. Still, he just shook his head. What happened? He got sick and died. That showed that he was a saved man. If God could not make him bring him in obedience, you'd have to take him out of the earth and bring him home. That's exactly what the Bible said. That's what the Bible promises. If you won't stand correction, you've got to come on home. So God cannot lose you after he saved you, but he can shorten your days here and make you pay for every sin you've done. So if you sin, you're going to have to pay for what you've done. Just remember that. Now, now the Lord be with you. I believe tonight that Brother Ramsey was saved. Absolutely, I believe it. But he just wouldn't obey God. And when he wouldn't obey God, God had to bring him home. That's the only thing to do because what was it? He had bring reproach and disgrace to the blood wherewith he was sanctified with. Is that right? And count the covenant an unholy thing. That isn't just exactly what this Hebrew letter says. See? It would be impossible for him to be lost. But he would bring shame and disgrace so God would have to take him off the earth and bring him home. That's exactly what would take place. Now may the Lord bless while we bow our heads just a moment for prayer. Now, most holy and gracious Father, we are indeed grateful to Thee for the promise that we have.
that you will never leave us or forsake us. You promised you'd go with us through life, and in death you'd be near us. You promised us that we had eternal life. You gave it to us freely. We could never lose it. All that comes to me has eternal life. And if it's eternal life, it has no end. And you promised to raise us up in the last day. To this we are very grateful. We are thankful that your word teaches us this. It gives us a sure hope. It makes us know that our Father is love. He loves us and He chose us. You said, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you. And I thank thee, Father, that thou hast done so. And many are sitting here tonight who's been ordained to eternal life and has received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and the fruits of the Spirit follow their life. Gentle, meek, humble, Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness. We're thankful for those. And we pray, Father, that if there be some in here tonight who doesn't have those fruits to accompany them, but they're resting upon some fantastic because they got worked up one day, because they got emotionally, they felt good, they made a shouted, they might have done many things. But, Father, if they haven't got the fruit of the Spirit, that keeps them day by day in constant love, forgiving their enemies, making right their wrongs, and living peaceful and loving and sweet and kind to one another, and a zeal for the church, a love for Christ and for His children. O oh, eternal God, forgive them. Though they be members of the church, members of the earthly body, May they go now and lay aside those carnal dead works Amen. and press on to the perfection. Grant it, Lord. May they come to the perfect one and receive him as their propitiation for their sins that he might stand as a perfect sacrifice for a guilty man and a guilty woman and supply them with his grace of love and peace until they come into the presence of God to live forever. Grant it, Father. While we have our heads bowed, if there be such a one that would like to swap a carnal life of ordinances, of baptisms, of sensations, of little carnal things like that, for a real heart full of real love, that, uh, that you could walk up to your bitterest enemy, put your arms around him and say, Brother, I pray for you. I love you. If you'd like to swap that experience of carnal things for a real experience of love, would you raise your hand to God and say, God, take me tonight. And make me what I should be. I'll pray for you right from the pulpit here. Would you desire prayer? Raise your hand. God bless you back there, sir. God bless you, brother. Someone else. God bless you, sir. I have been in the church for years. God bless you, sir. God bless you here, brother. God bless you back there, little lady. I will ask God to make me peaceful. Do you, are you real raging? Are you out of sorts? Do you doubt? Do you toss about? Do you wonder whether it's really right or not? When you come to Christ, do you come with a full assurance, a heart full of love? You walk up to Him without one fear, saying, I know that He's my Father. And there's no condemnation. You pass from death unto life. You know it. And you notice your life. You're loving. You're forgiving. You're gentle, you're peaceful, you're meek. All these fruits of the Spirit accompany your life day by day. And as soon as you do anything wrong, oh my, just as soon as you come to your mind you've done wrong, quickly you make it right. Right then, don't wait another minute. Go right then and make it right. If you don't, well, you don't have the Spirit of Christ. You might be a good woman. You might be a good man. You might be well thought of in the church. You might be well thought of in the neighborhood. But have you went on to that perfection, to that place to where you're wholly trusting in Christ? And by the, this, give you the seal, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and God gave him the seal of circumcision as a confirmation. Now, you say, I believe God, I made a confession. But did God give you the seal of the Holy Spirit back on your life? Of love, joy, fruits of the Spirit to prove that you've been saved. If He hasn't done that, then He hasn't recognized your faith yet. You've just made a confession. He hasn't accepted that there's something wrong. 
Would you like to receive him then? Raise your hand if there's someone else before we pray. God bless you, young lady. God bless you back there too. God bless you. All right, someone else? Just before we pray. All right, God bless you. Back there, sister. God bless you, brother. God bless you, brother. God bless you, my brother. That's right. Some 10, 15 hands has been up. Now let's pray. Blessed Lord, at their seat they're finding an altar. It's at their seat where they're sitting now that you spoke to their hearts that they're wrong. It's at their seats that you've put a desire in their heart that they long to be more like Jesus. They want their life changed. They want to be meek and humble. They want to be gentle and full of patience. They want to be long-suffering, forbearing. They want to be so Christian-like, so Christ-like, till the world will say as you go down the street, that man's really a Christian. That woman's really a Christian. Oh, they're the most gentle, meekest, sweetest people. Grant it, Lord, that they will receive that experience tonight. May they never rest upon their church ability, upon their affiliations with any church, any denomination, or neither upon their emotions, upon any fantastic, such as uh, uh, emotionally, something that's happened. May they shout in spoken tongues or something else. Oh, eternal God, let them not try to trust to get to heaven on that, for we've seen it so many times miserably fail, and you said it would fail. Where there's tongues, it shall cease. Where there's prophecy, it shall vanish. Where all there's knowledge, it shall vanish. All where all these things are, even gifts, miracles of healing, they shall all be done away with. Only that divine love shall last. God, create that in their heart and let them know that that is the Spirit that brings forth the fruits. Do it just now, Lord, while we wait on Thee. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Holes of fire flying. And to see uh, turtle doves going back and forth through the building. To see Christ come in with thorns in His hands and in His... Uh, oh, did you know that's the Antichrist set up? He said, when these things begin to come to pass and look up, your redemption's drawing nigh. Then that's the reason I like to press every minute I can to the church and get you solid. Brother Neville may not always be with us. I believe Brother Neville to be a good, sound gospel teacher. We don't know what will wind its way into this pulpit. And when it does get here, my sheep know my voice. Stay with that word. Don't you never leave that word. You stay right with it. And stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made you free. Amen. Be not entangled in all those yokes of bondage and so forth. Stand fast and stand free. God will bless you. We have nothing in the world to fear about. Amen. You're always wondering. I know as people come to be prayed for, they'll sidle into the line. Next time they see a Keeley campaign, they'll go into this line. They'll go into this line. I don't condemn them. They're trying to find relief, but they're going the wrong way. You're doing vice versa what God said not to do. See? When you walk up boldly to the throne of grace and believe that you asked, you shall receive. Uh, Stay with it. That's the way it's done. Not just caught from mission to mission, from church to church, from campaign to campaign. Well, they made these healing campaigns like a bunch of nonsense. Certainly they have. It's become to a place where intelligent people, they look around and they wonder what it's all about. That God don't want those things. Healing don't have to be in campaigns. Healing should be in every local church. Amen. All these gifts operating, but don't go to seed on those gifts. Amen. Don't pay attention to the gift. If God wants to use you for something, He'll do it. Amen. But look after the giver. Martin Luther, once after speaking in tongues, he was asked why he didn't preach it. He said, if I preach that, my people will go after the gift instead of the giver. Amen. Right. Moody one time speaking and began with his preaching so under inspiration he spoke in tongues. He said, God forgive me for muttering foolish words. Certainly. See? And uh, they had those things. We believe those things. But they must be put in their place and there must not be set as evidences. There's not one thing left in the Bible as evidence of the Holy Ghost, only the fruits of the Spirit. Find out any place that Jesus said so. Yes, sir. The evidence of the Holy Ghost is the fruit of your spirit. Jesus said, so by their fruit you shall know them. 
and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, peace, gentleness, meekness. Amen. And the fruit of the enemy is enmity, hatred, malice, strife, and so forth. That's the fruit of the enemy. So you can judge by the way you're living where you're standing with God. If your whole heart is in love with Him and you love Him and are gentle and live with Him daily, you know you've passed some death unto life. If it isn't and you're otherwise, you're just impersonating a Christian. That's right. Which all carnal impersonations will certainly be exposed. We know that. So, don't live that kind of a life. You don't have to. Why would you accept the substitute when the whole skies are above are full of the good and the real? Certainly. Let me take God. That's what I want. Amen. Now, did anybody come to be prayed for? If they did, raise your hand. We had the healing service this morning. I suppose then, this lady here. All right, sister, would you come forward then? Our brother elder here, come now for the anointing. bow our heads real quietly now. And shine on me again now. Come on now. Everybody go, shine. Just worship Him in your soul now. Getting quiet. The healing service is coming on. The message is over. Let's worship. Let the light from your light have Shine on me, oh shine on me, Lord, shine on me, let the light from the lighthouse shine. like Jesus, to be like Jesus, on earth I long to be like Him, all through life's journey. Such a beautiful light. Come where the dewdrops of mercy are bright. Shine all around the body and light. Jesus, the light. Of light proclaim Jesus, the light of the world. Then the bells of heaven will ring Jesus, the light of the Receive us, Lord, as we worship thee. We Walk in the light, beautiful light. Come where the dewdrops of mercy are bright. 
shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, alive. Don't you just love that scouring out? You feel good? Raise your hand. Say, oh, there's something about those old-fashioned songs, the old-time hymns. I'd rather have them in all these new worldly songs put in in, in Christian churches. I like that old time. I like Jesus settled. Long time ago, I told him, Lord, I don't want any trouble down at the river. <laughs> I want to be sure now. I want to know him. I want to know him. There's a big dark pit set before every one of us. We're headed that way. Every time our heart beats, we're closer and closer. But when I get there, I don't want to squirm like a coward. I want to wrap myself in the robes of his righteousness. Enter into it knowing this, that I know him in the power of his resurrection. That when he calls, I'll come out from among the dead. My, my faith looks up to thee. Let's sing it now. My faith looks up to thee. Thou hast taught us in thy most marvelous word. Our hearts just quiver with a rapturing grace to know that we pass from death unto life. It's all through the goodness of our Lord Jesus who called us and has washed us in his blood and has presented us before the throne of God faultless, blameless, for he took our sins. We have no sins. God laid the iniquity of us all upon him, and he was wounded for our transgression. Oh, how we love him, the great Lamb of God. And we pray, Father, that you'll give us utterance, expressions, that we can tell others that they might know him too, and love him, for he loves them. 
Give us this grace and thank you, Father, for those newborn babies that just come into the kingdom of God. May they find a good church home somewhere and there serve you until death liberates them from this old body of racked pains and aches and present them before him faultless, blameless in the age to come with eternal life. For we ask that in his name, amen.